Hello, my unforgettable friends, unforgettable men, unforgettable women, unforgettable you. So here we are getting into this book. One small step can change your life. The Kaizen Way by Robert Maurer. So uh, this is video two of reading this book here. And so we are now getting into my friends. We are getting into to the introduction. So without further ado, uh, let's get into this book. Um, actually, before I get into it real quick, this book has been revolutionary in my life and I know it'll be revolutionary in your life. A lot of people, uh, they think that life is just overwhelming and there's a lot to life or there's a lot they need to accomplish in order to be something or do this or do that. Um, the, the great amazing thing is, is that if you live in the present, you realize it's all small steps, all small steps. It's all small steps like uh, right here in this quote. Um, uh, that actually somewhere in here, where is it? Oh, yeah. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And that's what I want everybody to understand. And that's why I'm reading this and sharing this amazing book that Robert has wrote. And so here we go. We're going to get into the introduction. One small step. Japanese corporation have long used the gentle technique of Kaizen to achieve their business goals and maintain excellence. Now this elegant strategy can help you realize your personal dreams. Most of psychology and medicine is devoted to study why people get sick and don't function well in life. But throughout my career as a psychologist, I have always been intrigued by the opposite of failure. When a dieter loses 10 pounds and keeps it off, I want to know why. If a person finds love after years of unsatisfying relationships, I'm curious about the strategies that made this happiness possible. When a corporation says, stays on top of its game for 50 years, I want to understand the human decisions behind the success. And so here, so there, so we, so there have been two questions that have occupied my professional life. How do people succeed and how do successful people stay successful? Of course, there are as many ways to achieve success as there are successful people. But over the course of 32 years in practice, I've had the satisfaction of watching countless clients use unusual methods to create vast or lasting changes. They've applied the same, princi same principles to improve their life in just about every way. They've lost weight and kept it off, began an exercise program and stuck with it, kicked addictions for good, creating strong relationships, the kind that last, becoming organized without sl sliding when things get hectic and improve their career and continue to do so long after their performance report was filed. If you look, if you'd look to change, to make a change, one that sticks, I hope you'll read on. The method is something of an open secret one that has circulated among Japanese businesses for decades and is used daily by private citizens across the globe. It is natural, grace, graceful technique. It, it is a natural, graceful technique for achieving goals and maintaining excellence. It can, it can slip into even the tightest of schedules. And in this book, I will share this strategy with you. But first, I want you to meet Julie. Julie sat in the examination room, her eyes cast downward. She had 
come to UCLA's medical center for help with high blood pressure and fatigue. But the family practice res- resident and I could see that much more was going on. Julie was divorced mother of two. By her own admission, with a little distress and more than a little overwhelmed, her support system was shaky at best. She was just barely holding on to her job. The young doctor and I were concerned about Julie's long-term health. Her weight, she was carrying more than 30 extra pounds and soaring stress levels put her at increased risk of diabetes, hypoextension, heart disease, and deeper depression. It was clear that if Julie did not make some changes, changes, she was headed down the spiral spiral of disease and despair. She knew we knew a cheap, proven way to help Julie, and it wasn't a bottle of pills or years of psychotherapy. If you read the paper, if you read the papers or watch the news, you can probably guess what I'm talking about. Exercise. Regular physical activity could improve nearly all of Julie's health problems, give her more stamina to sustain her through her grueling days and boost her spirits. Once I might have offered this free and effective treatment with all the zeal of a new convert. Go jogging, ride a bike, rent an aerobics video, I might have said. Give up your your lunch break. Wake up an hour early if you have to if, if you have to. But just get up and make that commitment. Go or uh, uh, make that commitment to your health five times a week. But when I look at the dark circles under Julie's eyes, my heart sank. We'd probably told hundreds of patients to exercise, but very few of them make it a regular habit. They found it too time consuming, too sweaty, too much effort. I believe the most of them were also afraid of breaking out of their comfortable ruts. Although not all of the patients were aware of this fear. And here Julie sat, who worked, who worked almost constantly just to keep her kids' house cleaned and fed. Her only solace was relaxing for a half an hour or so on the couch most evenings. I could predict what would happen. The doctor would tell her to exercise. Julie would feel both misunderstood How am I going to find time to work out? You don't understand me at all and guilty. The resident physician would feel frustrated to see her advice ignored one more time and possibly start to become cynical as so many hopeful young doctors eventually do. What could I do to break this sad cycle? Charging uphill, innovation. When people want to change, they usually turn first to a strategy of innovation. Although you may usually think of innovation as a type of creative breakthrough. I'm using the term here as it is defined by business schools, where the vocabulary of success and change is highly specific. According to this definition, innovation is a drastic process of change. Ideally, it occurs in a very short period of time, yielding a dramatic turnaround. Innovation is fast, big, and flashy. It reaches for the largest result in the smallest amount of time. Although the term may be used, or although the term may be new to you, the idea behind it is probably quite familiar. In the corporate world, examples of innovation include highly painful strategies such as mass layoffs to strengthen the bottom line 
as well as more positive approaches such as massive investments in expensive new technology. Radical changes of innovation are also a favorite strategy for personal change. If Julie had wanted to apply innovation to her weight problem, she might have embarked on the kind of rigorous exercise program I mentioned. This program would require serious life changes. She would need to get her heart rate up for the last half an hour, five days a week. She'd have to find discipline to rearrange her schedule, cope with some serious init uh, initial muscle soreness, perhaps budget for the new clothing and shoes, and most of all, she would have to commit to her new program through those tough first weeks and months. For example, or other examples of an innovation for personal change include diets that ask you to cut out all your favorite foods at once, quitting an addiction, cold turkey, uh, auster austeri austerity plans for getting out of personal debt, jumping into risky social situations to conquer shyness. Sometimes innovation pr produces amazing results. Most of us can recall making a successful change through the kind of dramatic means listed above with immediate effects. With much deserved pride, you may be able to describe examples of innovation in your personal life, such as giving up smoking one day and never, ever returning to it. I applaud innovation as a way to make changes when it works. Turning our lives around on a dime can be a source of confidence and self-respect. But I have observed that many are crippled. Many people are crippled by the belief that innovation is the only way to change. We ignore the problem or challenges for as long as possible and then when we are forced by circumstances to or distress or duress, we attempt to make large leaps towards important or towards improvement. If the big leap lands us on greener territory, we congratulate ourselves and rightly so. But if we slip and fall and resulting pain and embarrassment can be devastating. Even if you are highly disciplined and a successful person, I'll bet you can remember many times that you have tried innovation and failed. Rather, it was a crash diet and crashed, or that or it was a crash diet that crashed, or an expensive relationship cure, perhaps a spontaneous trip to Paris that left your romance in the same ill health. <laughs> That's the problem with innovation. Too often, you meet with success in, short, in the short term only to find yourself falling back into old ways when your initial burst of enthusiasm fades away. Radical change is like, changing, is like charging up a steep hill. When you may run out of wind before, you may run out of wind before you reach the crest. And for and or the thought of it all work ahead, work ahead makes you give up no sooner than you begin. There is an alternative to innovation. It is, an, it is the path, it is another path altogether. One that winds so gently up the hill that you hardly notice the climb. It is pleasant to negotiate and soft to tread. And all that it requires is that you place one foot in front of the other. Welcome to Kaizen. This alternative strategy for changing is called Kaizen. Kaizen is captured in this familiar but powerful saying. The journey of a thousand miles must begin with one step. Lao Taos. Despite their foreign name, Kaizen, small steps for continually improving was first applied systematically 
in depression in depression era of America. When France when France uh, where am I here? When France fell into Nazi Germany in, in 1940, America le American leaders realized how urgently the Allies needed shipments to our military of military equipment. They also were forced to acknowledge that American soldiers might soon be sent abroad as well, required their own tanks, weapons, and supplies. American manufacturers would need to step up the quality and quantity of their equipment production and quickly. The challenge was intensified by the loss of many qualified factory supervisors to the American Army, Army Armed Forces, which were busy making their preparations for war. To overcome these tight times and personal constraints, the U.S. government created a management or created management courses called Training Within Industry, TWI, and offered them the corporation and offered them to cooperate throughout America. One of these courses held the seed of what would, in another time and place, be known as Kaizen. Instead of encouraging radical, more innovative changes to produce the demands result demanded results the IT IW the TWI course exhorted managers towards what is called continuous improvement the course manually manually uh, urged supervisors to look for hundreds of small things you can approve don't try to plan a whole new department layout or go after a big installation of new equipment. There isn't time for this. There isn't time for these major items. Look for improvements on existing jobs with your present equipment. One of the most vocal advocates of continuous improvement at, at this time was Dr. W. Edwards Deming, a statistician who worked on a quality control term and aided American manufacturers as they tried to find their wartime footing. Dr. Deming instructioned, or instructed managers to involve every single employee in the improvement process. The intense time pressure was transformed elitism and snob snobbery into unaffordable luxuries. Everyone from those of the lowest rungs to the men in the cat bird seat was encouraged to find little ways to increase the quality of their product and the efficiency of creating it. Suge su suggestion boxes were positioned on factory floors so that line workers could suggest ways of improving productivity. And executives were obligated to treat each of these comments with great respect. At first, this philosophy must have seemed shockingly inadequate under the circumstances, but somehow these little steps added up to brilliant uh, acceleration of American manufacturing capacity. America's uh, manufacturing capacity. The quality of American equipment and the speed of its production were two of the major factors in the Allied victory. When you improve a little each day, eventually big things occur. When you improve conditions a little each day, eventually you have big improvements in conditioning. Not tomorrow, not the next day, but eventually a big gain is made. Don't look for the big, quick improvement. Seek the small improvement one day at a time. That's the only way it happens. And when it happens, it lasts. John Wooden, one of the most successful coaches in history of college basketball. This philosophy of small steps 
towards improvement was introduced to J Japan after the war. When General Douglas MacArthur's occup occupation forced forces began to rebuild the devastating country or devastated country. If you are familiar with Japanese corporate dominance in the late 20th century, you may be surprised to hear that many of its post-war businesses were run poorly. They slacked management, management practices and low employee morale. General MacArthur saw the need to improve Jap Japanese efficiency and raise business standards. A thriving Japanese economy was in MacArthur's best interest because a strong society could provide a bulk work against the possible threat of North Korea and keep his troops in steady supplies. He, bought, he brought in the U.S. government's TWI specialists, including those who emphasized the importance of small daily steps towards change. At the same time that MacArthur was holding forth on small steps, the U.S. Air Forces developed a class in management and supervision for the Japanese businesses near one of its local bases. The class was called the Management Training Program, MTP, and its tenets, its tenets were almost identical to those developed by Dr. Deming and his colleagues at the beginning of the war. Thousands of Japanese business managers were enrolled. The Japanese were unusually receptive to this idea. Their in the industrial base destroyed, they lacked the resources for sweeping reorganization and it wasn't it wasn't lost on Japanese business leaders that their country had been defeated in part by American American super or superior equipment and technology. So they listened closely to the Americans' lessons on manufacturing. Viewing employees as a source of creativity and improvement and learning to be receptive to subordinates' ideas was an unfamiliar notion, as it had been for Americans. But the, gradu but the graduates of these programs gave it a try. These entrepreneurs, managers, and executives went on to work in civilian industries where they excitedly spread the gospel of small steps. In the US, Dr. Deming's series of strategy for enhancing the manufacturing process were largely ignored once the troops were home and production was back to normal. In Japan, however, its concepts were already part of the emerging Japanese business culture. In the late, in the late 1950s, the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, JUSE, invited Dr. Deming, the wartime proponent of quality control, to consult further on their country's economic efficiencies and output. As you probably know, Japanese businesses, which rebuilt themselves on the bedrock of small steps, soon rocketed to unheard levels of productivity. Small steps were so successful that the Japanese gave them a name of their own, Kaizen. Kaizen versus innovation. Kaizen and in innovation are two major strategies people use to create change. Where innovation de demands shocking and radical reform, all Kaizen asks is that you take small, comfortable steps towards improvement. In the 1980s, Kaizen began to cross back over to the US, mainly in high technical business applications. I first encountered the industri industrial exercise of Kaizen as a corporate consultant. As a student of success, I became intrigued with this philosophy and began to study 
it more deeply. For decades now, I explored the application of Kaizen, Kaizen's small steps to personal success. In my clinical work with individual clients and as a faculty member of the University of California at Los Angeles School of Medicine, I had plenty of opportunity to witness who needed or who need to change their lives, to kick a bad habit, ease their loneliness, or break out of an unsatisfactory career. When I insist corpor corporations, helping business executives grapple with tough situations is particularly or practically my job description. Over and over, I've seen people barely attempt to implement revolutionary schemes for improvement. Some succeeded, but most did not. Often these frustrated souls gave up accepting life's consolation prize rather than pursuing their real ambitions. Having encountered the industrial exercise of Kaizen is my cor is, or in my corporate work, actually I'm gonna repeat that again. Having encountered the industrial exercise of Kaizen in my corporate work, I began to wonder whether Kaizen had a place inside the psychologist's office as a strategy not just for simple profit, but for the experience expansion of behavioral, cognitive, and even spiritual potential of people like Julie. Small steps, giant leaps. Julie st struck me as the perfect candidate for change in its smallest, least threatening form. I looked, as, I looked on as Julie waited to hear what the resident had to say. As I predicted, the resident talked to Julie about the importance of taking time for herself and getting some exercise. Just as she was about to tell Julie to spend at least 30 minutes of m most days on uh, aerobically challenging exercises and recommendations that would have likely been met with disbelief and anger, I find myself jumping in. How about if you just march in place in front of the television each day for one minute? The, re the resident shot me an uh, in incredulous look, but Julie brightened a little and said, I could give that a try. When Julie returned for the follow-up visit, she reported that she indeed marched in front of her TV set for one minute each night. Granted, she wasn't going to get much healthier with just six minutes of low intense exercises. But during this visit, I noticed that Julie's attitude had changed. Instead of coming back discouraged as so many failed exercisers do, Julie was more animate or animated or yeah, animated with less resistance in her speech and demeanor. What else could I do in one minute a day? She wanted to know. I was thrilled. A small success, yes, build, but much better than the all around discouragement I've seen so many times. We begin to guide Julie slowly towards a healthier life, building up the exercise habit minute by minute. With a few months, within a few months, Julie found that her resistance to a more complete pro, uh, fitness program was dissolved. She was now eager to take full aerobics workouts, which she performed regularly and enthusiastically. At the same time, I introduced a little Kaizen step to another patient at the medical center. So clients in my psychology practice and to the corporations that hired me as a consultant I'm now taking, talking about really small steps here, one that seems almost embarrassingly trivial at first. Instead of encouraging clients to leave unsatisfact unsat unsatisfying careers, I might have them spend a few seconds a day imagining the detail, details of a dream job. 
if a patient wanted to cut out caffeine, she'd start by taking one less zip each day. A frustrated manager might actually try giving smaller, not larger rewards to employees to increase their motivation. The personal application of Kaizen transforms its nature. Businesses and factories tend to let small steps for improvement accumulate into large change. But the philosophy of the individual is a little different. In fact, a surprising number of clients intuitively perceive what it took, what it took me years of observation to see. That low-key change helps the human mind circumnavigate the fear that blocks success and creativity. Just as a student driver practices in an empty parking lot, first just sit in the drive in just sit in the car and try out its equipment and and then drive for a few minutes at a time. My clients learn to master the smallest steps of change in a safe, non-threatening environment. Often people find their minds develop minds develop a desire for new behavior, whether it is regular exercise as Julie's case, a diet, cleaning off their desk, or spending time with a loving, supportive companion instead of a destructive one. Eventually my clients are startled to discover that they have reached their goals with no additional conscious effort on their part. How does this happen? I believe that the Kaizen approach is highly effective method of building new neural connections in the brain. An idea I'll address in more detail in the coming chapters. As one client often said to me, the steps were so small I couldn't fail. Because the vast majority of people want to improve their health, relationships, careers, this book devotes much of its, t- its space to these topics. But the principles I outline here can apply to any project for change, whether the goal is ending a nail-biting habit or learning to say no to the empty demands that suck up all your time. As you consider your plans for change, I hope you'll want to keep in mind the original intent of the small steps philosophy. Kaizen is effective, enjoyable way to achieve a specific goal, but it also extends to more profound challenges or before uh, extends to more profound challenge to meet life's constant demands for change by seeking out continual but always small improvements. Through decades of work with people of all stripes with unique strengths and needs, I've developed a theory about why Kaizen works when all else fails. The outline, I outline this theory in the first chapter. The succeeding chapters are devoted to small applications of Kaizen and encompass six different strategies. These strategies include Asking small questions to dispel fear and inspire creativity. Thinking small thoughts develop new skill habits without moving a muscle. Taking small actions that guarantee success. Solving small problems even when they're faced with overwhelming crisis. Mm -hmm. Bestowing small rewards to yourself or others to produce the best results. Recognizing the small but crucial moments that everyone else ignores. No matter whether you're interested in Kaizen is philosophically or practically, whether you want to change the world or drop a few uh, pounds, this book is now yours to be used in whatever manner you see fit. Certainly, you don't need to try all the six strategies listed above if that doesn't appeal to you. 
I'm always delighted when clients take up one or two or three of these techniques, cooking up highly individualized menu for change. In the chapters to, in the chapters to come, I will demonstrate how people combined Kaizen techniques for personal results. And I invite you to think of these strategies in the same spirit using those that speak most clearly to you. In each chapter, you'll find highlighted instructions for a specific Kaizen technique, along with suggestions for adapting the technique in your own needs. I encourage you to read these chapters and try a small step or two, even if that means changing nothing more than the way you think about your colleagues for a few seconds a day or doing something as small as seemingly ridiculous as flossing one tooth each night. Just remember, while the steps may be small, what we're reaching for is not. To commit your life to honoring and maintaining your physical health to the passion, the risk, and the excellence of a demanding career, to the pursuit of a rewarding relationship with another human being, or the continual upward revision of your personal standards, is to strive for powerful goals, often elusive and at times frightening. But for now, all you need to do is take one small step. Well, my folks, that concludes the introduction to One Small Step Can Change Your Life. And I want to thank you. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to this uh, channel. Also, uh, look at uh, the links in the description for past uh, readings. I'm going through this whole book and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Have yourself an incredible, incredible day and we'll see you in the next video for chapter, chapter one. Take care.